All right, waiting for that live thing to finally go through. Welcome to the Off by One security stream. This week, our guest, as you can see, is Moses Frost, who has been on previously. That's right, right, Moses? Yeah, at least once. Yeah. <laughs> at least once, he yeah, definitely once. But um, Moses, if you don't know, he runs the SANS 588 cloud penetration testing course. He's the lead author and primary instructor of that one and has been around SANS for quite a long time, as long as my, uh, as well as myself. And, you know, obviously cloud penetration testing is something that's gained a lot of interest, understandably so, ever since, especially the pandemic, when things really ramped up with the work from home efforts and, and the like. And what, you know, what it's interesting because Moses will kind of correct me here if I misstate anything as well, but when you take a traditional penetration tester, and by traditional, I mean someone who, you know, historically knows the end map and, you know, the phases of reconnaissance and scanning and exploitation and, and data exfiltration, um, primarily network penetration testing using things like Metasploit or, and then going on to, of course, the uh, newer command and control type platforms and such, like maybe Cobalt Strike or maybe something free. You've got Covenant and Slither, tons of them out there. Um and, and then you introduce a new, I guess I could say, attack surface, uh, the cloud. If you are not a penetration tester or red teamer who has a strong background in cloud technology, whether it be Google or AWS or uh, Azure, then that may be something that obviously is uh, going to introduce some challenges for you. And the question is, like, where do you start? I remember when Moses first wrote this course, at the beginning, we had a lot more kind of introductory cloud technology information because we did find that the majority of the students coming in lack that basic foundational knowledge of how the cloud works and architecture and such. So as, as time went on, as you can expect, more and more people got some understanding of the cloud. And so Moses started to reduce the amount of content that we would consider prerequisite something you should already know before going into the course. That way there's more advanced cloud uh, type material in there. But I'm going to start off right here with, with a question for Moses, because this is something, so usually what happens is if I announce the stream, I'm pretty bad about announcing the stream really early in advance so people can plan to attend it. But I try to do it at least a couple days beforehand if I do have a guest that's going to be on. And that usually results in me getting some DMs on Twitter or some other way uh, asking questions. Some people don't like to type it up in the live stream chat or whatever. So this one kind of goes a little bit into what I was just describing. So it's going to be a long kind of statement slash question, Moses, and then I'll give you some time to answer, obviously, because there's going to be a lot here. But I'm combining multiple questions that seem to be related. And the question is, what do you think the first thing a traditional penetration tester should do if wanting to understand and branch out and approach cloud pen testing? And I'm not done. It's certainly the case where if you gain access to an end user's computer, let's say you did phishing or something like that, and you can then, of course, pivot into different areas with that access potentially. So what does that look like? Like, Take us through an example of if I were to fish somebody, do some 2FA or multi-factor authentication bypass, game remote code execution on the user system, and then let's, you know, I'm able to then access and I've exposed this area called the cloud that I personally don't know anything about and if it's something like does does outlook is, is it typically the case where a user is vpn into like the company data center and then that access is into azure or something like that with domain replication and authentication that way or is it more like the user is uh, over https straight from their home internet connection into azure and they're authenticating that way so trying to understand like what exposes itself to you and what would you what would you do at that point done yeah oh man okay that's a, there's a lot to that is like a lot to unpack all right um so let's start with um when we say cloud let's just start with cloud generic right um the way that i got exposed to the cloud was because i've been around like that is the way that i was exposed to the cloud so my original aws experience was because I was very into not security at all. I was actually very into virtualization and VMware and ran VMware user groups back early on. And um, back in the early 2000s, this technology that NASA and Rackspace created um, was being announced. And that technology was called OpenStack. And it was kind of interesting. It was really 
hard to understand and you never, ever, ever want to set up your own open stack environment because it's a cluster. Um, so what we saw then was a forking almost of that technology as almost like as a service. And a lot of those technologies ended up showing up in Amazon. And so Amazon took, I don't know if it's a carbon copy of it. It's, I'm sure it's very different now, but they took a lot of those infrastructure items and they made them into services, right? Very long ago, right? So if I was to try to explain to somebody what they need to know to pivot to the cloud, um, the first place that we start in class is talking about things that I found to be difficult to understand as a junior person, which was the difference between the control plane um, and the data plane, right? So where where is it that we have control plane and where is it that we have the data plane and how do they meet? And so um, I try to give um, examples that everybody generically may know by now, right? So VMware, how does VMware work? What would be the VMware control plane? What would be the VMware data plane? And then I can start to explain to people like, okay, well, vCenter is control plane. You can launch a VM, you can modify uh, VMDKs, um, you can move around machines, you can create networks, you can open up firewall rules, that's control plane. If I can get access to your control plane, um, which we do in, in actual pen tests, we actually do get into people's control planes, um, then we can start extracting uh, the valuable parts and modify the data plane, right? Um, so I, I, I work at a company called Nuvic. We do red team assessments and I run the cloud pen testing stuff. And as, as an example, w one of the things that we may do in your environment that we're known to do is if we can get into your storage environment or your VMware environment, we don't have to worry about your EDR. We can take that VMDK, snapshot it, extract it, dump it out into our system. We're known to like, you know, dump it out put it in, put LSAS, put the actual memory dump in um, WinDebug, load Mimikatz in WinDebug and pull out LSAS, right? These are things that people aren't even aware you could do, right? We could translate that process into the cloud. So if I can get access to your AWS console and you haven't encrypted your volumes, then I can extract your volumes, break open your machines, maybe insert my own machine or maybe insert my own items and then from there, I have all, not free reign, but I have a, a, the ability to go in and to start maybe getting into the data plane. So now I can go laterally, right? So that's that's kind of how we start, right? Now to answer your other question, uh, pen tester goes in, breaks into Outlook, right? What do you do? It, when you start to look at cloud environments, right? So you and I are using Outlook and Outlook is in Office 365. And I've got a demo that shows you kind of this how this works. But when we're doing Outlook, Outlook has your key material embedded in either the TPM or somewhere in LSAS that is transmitted to the Azure AD environment. And that key material, um, it allows you to become that user, right? So the difference between cloud pen testing and what you would see in another, in another kind of environment, a, re a regular pen testing environment where you don't have a cloud infrastructure, is that we understand after 20 years or 25 years, how Windows 2000 AD works. So we understand Kerberos by now, we know what Kerberos thing is. We have experience in pass the hash, pass the ticket, golden ticket, silver ticket. We understand all these things, but it's only been in the last two years, three years, that people really started to get the handle on things like passing an, a refresh token to be able to gain access into somebody's Azure environment. And the refresh token is very similar to a Kerberos, um, not a golden ticket or a silver ticket, but maybe just a Kerberos ticket granting ticket, if you will, right? So very analogous, uh, analogous kind of ways of, of looking at how these things are built. Um, when it comes to Microsoft specifically, they unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, or purposeful or not purposeful, there are some things that they have done to somewhat replicate what is happening on premise, right? So, um, you know, if you look at Okta, or you look at Google Workspace or some of these competing products, you can't take your Windows computer and join it to the Okta system, right? There's no such thing as like 
joining a machine to an Active Directory domain, right? Not that I'm aware of. I've never encountered it ever. But it turns out in Microsoft world, if you're running Azure AD, the hosted version of, of their, their IDP, um, you can. You can actually join machines into the Azure network and start to get permission. So there's all these like very familiar concepts that start to translate when it comes to Microsoft world. And I find it to be uh, almost uh, uh, fun again, because some of the barriers, some of the restrictions that we may have grown accustomed to aren't necessarily there. It's, it's a very unexplored territory. Um, and I got some fun ones, war stories uh, around things that we have recently found that might even dovetail to that conversation. So you could kind of get an idea of, of how fun or how different the cloud can be. I hope that answered yeah. that question. Yeah, well, like I said, big question and big answer. So <laughs> yeah, I'll have to go back and re-listen to it again. <laughs> no, it's very helpful. <laughs> yeah, it's, I, uh, I stopped thinking about it a while ago. Yeah, it's just uh, I remember some a couple of a couple of guys came to me and they were like potentially presenting a course proposal or idea for us to do, and 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 the idea was a bit around, hey, there's a lot of environments out there, especially like if you take traditional Silicon Valley and such, where it's not all Microsoft, it's all Linux boxes or all Mac, and there aren't many, if any, Windows systems, but there's still that you know way to to pivot into the cloud from those environments as well. So they wanted to kind of create a class where it's like red teaming non-active directory environments and pivot into the cloud from you know the on-prem stuff, which is quite neat. I'm still trying to figure out it's really hard to get information on how many companies out there are, are still have a data center or or if there is one, it's very small now and they moved most of that stuff into the into the cloud. Like I've asked some people out in, in Europe and I've gotten actually more people saying that there are less companies that have fully or pr mostly migrated to the cloud than what I found when asking folks in, in the US. So I think it's regionally different as well based on things like uh, maybe uh, different data classification laws and such. No, no, I think it's, it's cultural. I'm gonna be honest, it's cultural. So when I first, um, when I was first looking at what the class was going to be like and um, my experience with the different people um, that were ever doing things in the class, I, um, my, my initial gut, the initial thing that I took away from the class was, hey, um, my experience before the pandemic was that Europe was never going to go into the cloud and it had nothing to do with data sovereignty as much as it had to do with just trust. Like, we're not going to remove our cloud infrastructure ever. We're not going to remove our data centers ever. Um, it, if you've got, I'll be frank, if you're a Fortune 500, um, what I've seen mostly is hybrid environments. They've got their data center to some cost. They might be reducing the footprint, but they're never going to remove the data center from their environment. If you're a under 100 user company or you're a new company, you're probably not going to spend $100,000 to build out a data center. You're just not, right? I mean, you're not going to put in a rack. You're not going to buy co-location space. You're not going to buy physical servers. You're probably just going to say, let's build a bunch of servers in the cloud. It'll be cheaper um, at the beginning. What I have seen over time is that there is some use cases where they want to build their own data center. Uh, but by far and large, if you're a newer company, I have seen them move mostly to the cloud or using cloud infrastructure. Um, as far as like the Silicon Valley thing that you were talking about, um, yeah, when I was working in Silicon Valley, um, I found that there was a lot of Macs and a lot of um, Linux machines for servers and very few Windows. But in your traditional enterprise, I still see a lot of Windows, a lot of Windows. And people still very refusing to support things like Mac. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing, right? It's a very, very kind of different thing. Um, actually, I got a great little war story for you um, to talk about the cloud if you wanna. <laughs> I mean, unless there's, a, actually, I shouldn't be, I should ask, was there any other questions at the- Yeah, let's, let's go, let's go through yeah. a couple questions. So yeah. do you, can you see the questions on the right-hand side? I can uh, read it to you if not. Oh, look at that. No, no, no. I did not see them. Look at that. Yeah, so let's 
take on a few of those, and then let's start talking about the demo that you want to start showing. Sure, people. sure, sure. People, of course, love the demos. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So, what is uh, what does it what does it take to be on this stream? <laughs> hmm. <laughs> hmm. What does it take to be on a stream? Well, you have to be handsome. Zero days. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, yeah, if you, I've said it before. If you do have something that you think the community would be interested in, just definitely hit me up, uh, DM me on Twitter or something like that. It's open to everyone. And uh, if you've got something cool you want to talk about, like a new technique or something that you're an expert at that you think the community would love to hear about, uh, just send me your ideas and, and I'll, you know, we, can, we can see what happens. I'll, I'll but, take a zero day, though. If you got like a Windows zero day, I'll take one. Like, yeah. You never know. <laughs> Um, so the, the, the one question that you get is what are your top tools for the cloud? Um, so I'll give you some, some tools that we use that can help you kind of get your hands around things. Right. Um, so I'm a big fan of what the NCC group created with, um, scout suite. Now I've talked to a few people that, uh, used to work there, um, that were key to the tool. Um, and it's been fixed. They've been updating it over time, uh, but at, at the beginning, it was mostly focused on AWS, a little bit on Azure, and less so on GCP. If you look at the latest commits, you'll see more and more clouds being supported. But what I will say is, many of the tools that I'm going to talk about, there's gaps. There's always gaps. So don't rely on the tools as much because it's early days, and so you're going to miss stuff. Uh, but Scout Suite is great if you've got. Um, read-only access to an environment, which normally I ask for. Or if you've got like um, limited access, Scout Suite will actually brute force the APIs to see what you can access. It's kind of a nice tool. Um, for AWS specific, we used to use Paku a lot. Um, it was like kind of orphaned for a while. Uh, the person who wrote it, the author who wrote it, uh, Spencer, um, he passed away. He worked for Rhino Security Labs. Um, and it's gone through different hands, but it's a great tool for like actually evaluating or automating, I should say, some of the AWS um, um, attacks. It's not perfect. Um, it needs some work, but it's it's okay. Um, you know, for Azure, for example, um, there's token tax uh, token tactics from RevShell that's amazing. Um, Dirk Jan, he's got a whole suite of Road Recon, Road Token that's really fun. Um, you know, Bloodhound now supports Azure AD, so we've got hybrid support. It's really cool for that. Um, Bishop Fox, um, Carlos and a couple of other people created a tool called CloudFox over at Bishop Fox, and it, it has some nice enumeration techniques in there. Um, so these are just some of the tools that, that we use um, just for the cloud stuff, for enumeration. Now, there are other tools out there that we heavily rely on. So almost anything from project discovery has been a gift. Um, just for generic recon. So if you've never taken a look at those tools, recommend you do that. Um, that was a good question there. Um, uh, trying to see if there's anything else. <laughs> uh, somebody wants an active consultation right now on how to break into AC2. Uh, <laughs> uh, he wants to know how to like actually like extracting. Uh, AWS CLI is your answer. Um, AWS CLI, that's your answer. Um, anyway, that's that's what I would say. And of course, there's always compliments in case you need those, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Um, so yeah, if uh, if we missed your question, go ahead and retype it up, or if it wasn't answered the way you like, uh, we'll get back to it. But Moses, why don't you show us some cool stuff? Yeah. So uh, this is a this is a fun one from the from uh, some of us uh, at Nuvik. Um, let me let me know when you want me to add the stream. I uh, you can do it now. I'll just throw up here my um All right, there we go. my PowerPoint. I could I'm just gonna draw it out for you because I think this is actually a pretty cool um thing is it in there is it there yeah i'm sharing cool um i can't see it so <laughs> all right so i'm going to talk about a, an application and i'm going to talk about uh two things right and then i'll show you guys some demos on how we abuse these two things so the first thing we're going to talk about is what is open id connect because you need to know this in order for you to understand what i'm doing right so anybody that's ever used Windows Azure, right? You're 
you may have um, run into this, right? So the way it works is you have Outlook, right? So you got Outlook and you want to log into uh, your Outlook environment and your Outlook environment is sitting in O365. And so O3, when you first try to open up Outlook or whatever, it tries to connect to O365 and it says, uh, O365 says, I don't know who you are. You got to log in. Or if you've already logged in, maybe you uh, need to, maybe you're what they call an access token, right? So this is your key material. It may have been expired, right? And access tokens expire after an hour. Uh, they should anyway. So if you've ever, if you're doing any pen testing work and you're doing assessments on a IDP, the recommendation is that the access token be expired after one hour. And the reason for that is um, if somebody were to man in the middle of this conversation, they could steal your access token and dwell for the maximum time of one hour. Okay. Now, typically in this scenario, what should happen, and I've seen wrong implementations, right? So let's, you'll see in a second. So what should happen typically is at this point, O365 says, hey, go to your IDP and log in. And regardless of your actual identity provider, whoever that is, um, you've always got to go to Azure AD. Even if you use Okta, you got to go to Azure AD um, for Federation. So let's just say you're Azure AD. You, log, you basically um, log in or you have two options. You can log in, which is the typical option. Or if your refresh token has not expired, right? If it's not expired, it can refresh your access token, right? So refresh token should live for by default 14 days. Um, after 14 days, you will be asked to re-authenticate, right? And that you should, you should be asked after seven days or 14 days to re-authenticate. Uh, we ran into environments where the re-authentication window is, I don't know, 90 days, which is crazy, right? You don't have to do this login for 90 days, which means if I can capture your primary refresh token, I can capture that, then I can I can dwell in the environment for the maximum expiration time of that re primary refresh token. Um, 14 days is default, seven days would be kind of aggressive, um, but any more than 14 days might be too weak. Um, regardless, you refresh, your token, your access token. So the idea here is the refresh token will refresh the access token so that it has a new one hour window. And then O365 says, oh, you're Moses. You want to log into email. You have a valid access token. I believe you're Moses because it's in this uh, JSON web token. And it says, you know, that your um, user principal name, and this is important, your UPN, is Moses, right, at whatever. This will be relevant in a minute, OK? So cool. You know, this is your typical flow. Nothing, nothing special here. Now, that's we call this system uh, generically. We would call this system the Azure AD system, or we would call it Azure AD uh, B2B, okay? So whenever you're dealing with an uh, OpenID Connect system like Okta or SailPoint or whatever, this enterprise flow where your users are is business to business or B2B. Um, now, let's talk about what we found because I think it's really f interesting, um, fun little thing. Um, what we found was AWS Cognito, which is a B2C, business to consumer, or they might call it a CIAM, I think, uh, which is a, a customer identity access management, okay? Um, and what it does is it sits here. You build your little app, right? You build your, your login portal, right? Um, and then you have like, I don't know, maybe your, your real application, whatever, whatever that real application is. And this is important because we actually had these three pieces in our system, right? Um, and with these three pieces, as a user, right, you would be able to go over here and say, please give me your username and password. You would give it your username and password, 
and it would formulate a request. And the request was sent to this system here, Azure uh, Cognito, uh, as a, what do you want to do? You know, kind of thing, right? And there's all sorts of Cognito bugs uh, that we talk about in class. Um, but what we found was really interesting. Um, this particular bug was one in which when you logged into Cognito, there's what they call a mutable claim and an immutable claim. So I'll give you an example of what a, a mutable claim is. Um, in a standard system, in a standard application, you as an end user might be able to change your email, right? So you might be uh, 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 Moses at whatever.com, right? But in the application, your username should not be changeable in this way, right? It should be an immutable claim, okay? Such that your, your username should, whatever it is, it should not deviate unless you have a process to mechanically do it, okay? Now, in Cognito, you can actually change through the CLI the mutable claims, right? Which means email, in this case, is a claim that the user can control. This shouldn't be problematic in any way, right? This should just be, eh, whatever, normal, normal stuff. But as it turns out, there was a miscommunication between this application owner and this application owner. So in this application, they decided to use a immutable claim called preferred username. Actually, Steve, you know what? If you don't mind, I hate to do this, but I just have to close the door real quick. Okay, no worries. Yeah, it's funny when you uh, see people teaching classes. Sorry about that. Been just to, to make a class. Sure that we all my... have our own way of uh, <laughs> drawing on the screen and stuff like that. My, my, paint is my preferred tool of choice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, paint is always a, a, a great thing, right? Anyway, so I'll give you an example where this kind of bit the owner, right? So preferred username is an example of a user of an immutable claim in uh, Cognito. And this was my preferred username. Um, but I could go in and change my email to whatever I wanted. So in this case, I was able to change it to victim email at targetdomain.com. And what would happen is I could log into here with this new uh, email address and this downstream system was not looking at this value to marry the accounts. Instead, they incorrectly decided to use this value, which means that I was able to take over the account for victim email at targetdomain.com. Right? Because what the application was doing is it was trusting the claim and normalizing or downcasing whatever the email address was. So instead of it, uh, you know, instead of it, um, see, it, instead of it being uh, like this, right? So it was saying it was saying that this username and this preferred name were the same user as the uppercase version of this, and so we were able to take over accounts simply by knowing what the target username was and changing the case sensitivity of the uh, email claim uh, that we did. And this translates to Azure as well, right? So if you're a Azure customer and you have Azure B2B or Azure B2C, um, if you've ever gone into the Azure Active Directory system itself, and I'm just going to bring one up so you can see. I'm going to move it over here in a second. So if you uh, actually, let me bring it up full screen. Here we go. Uh, let's see if I, yeah. It should, it should come up, but Azure might actually fail. So <laughs> we don't know, right? It's kind of the demo gods. Of course, it would it would fail during the live stream, right? 
course. It, it would always it always has to perform well. I play Microsoft. <laughs> Let me see if I can actually get. Oh, there it is. So this would be a user principal name, right? That would be the idea. But if your application, like the way it would work is your application should always accept the user principal name value in Azure AD. A standard user can modify all these other values, right? Including email. So you as an end user can modify this to whatever you want. And if the foreign system is using this value and it's trusting what I say, so I, if, I, if I made this um, steve at sans.org or whatever, or steve at sims.com, um, then you would be able, I would be able to send that claim in and if your application accepts it, I'm this user now. It's like a complete confusion attack, which I, you know, these are the kind of things you find in these web applications that are very architectural. There's nothing that a scanner can do to fix this. It just, it is the way it's coded. And that's what kind of makes it um, kind of a fun area, right? Because when you discover these things, you're like, oh, that's, that's pretty wild. So then after we discovered this, we decided from now on, these are the kind of bugs that we're going to look for in IDPs, right? Because this might be happening to many, many, many customers, right? And so it goes into our playbooks and, it, and we update our attack streams, right? That's just one example of how we abuse these IDPs, right? Do you find, do you find that most of the stuff is uh, like when you discover these types of techniques that the organization or team or whoever discovers that they hold it close to their chest and they use that as something that they have that others don't? Or do you find that most people share this stuff always or is it a mixture? <laughs> Um, you get I don't a competitive know. edge, obviously. You get a competitive edge if you keep it, but <laughs> no, we actually, um, I mean, I think from the cloud community, a lot of people share. Um, a lot of the discoveries that I've seen in the current uh cloud security community, um, is done by uh cloud security providers like Wiz or Datadog or some of these other groups that their research teams are feeding rules into their uh, cloud security platform for customers. And so I'm seeing a lot of knowledge sharing and transfer of knowledge. There's other people out there like um, uh, Nestori uh, Sianima. He's done a lot of work on Azure AD uh, for SecureWorks. And his work is pretty open in what he does. So I, I, I'm seeing a lot of sharing. Um, so that that is the good news. There always will probably be some unshareable things out there that people are working on because they can't share it. Yeah. Of uh, for, so, for someone reason. just said, I feel like I feel like with this case, the report proof of concept was wrote wrongly too. I'm sorry. I'm not sure exactly what the that's in reference to. Uh, can you elaborate that uh, that guy? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The usernames yeah. are always great here. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the actual issue the actual issue here is that this claim, so the actual, just to kind of give everybody clarification as to what the issue is. This is the claim that every single part of this application should be using because this is a claim that the user cannot modify, right? But this application team here, they decided to use this claim to identify the account that was logging in. And the problem with using this claim here is that it, this is user controllable. So this is not user controllable, this is. So you could change your email to whatever you want that's a valid account on the real application and the real application was confused as to who was logging in. That's a, the ultimate issue with that. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, that's the same person said, uh, I have seen this bug before, so I don't know. Um... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting bug. I mean, it, uh... it's it's the, the world of bug bounties too. I mean, I, it's one of the funny things that you don't get into this too much with binary exploitation, but I, and I don't do web exploitation hardly at all. Um, but I've seen so many people report in something, and and the, the the person comes back and said it's a duplicate, it's a duplicate. I know it's a big joke in the community. I could talk to Hassan Al Hadari, who has discovered so many different bugs in so many places, and I, he's explained to me how that whole process works. Now some people feel like no, the vendor's lying. It, it is not a duplicate. They're just saying it is. They don't want to pay me. And, but um, yeah, so many things are found over and over again. It's like every time a technique comes out, I'm like, I wonder how long some other group 
or individual was using that technique and then now someone else discovered it and releases it and then it gets shut down it's crazy yeah yeah there, there's nothing i mean you know you you follow the you've been in the industry so long that when somebody comes up with a new technique you're like wait a minute that looks like this old technique but just with a different spin you know like it's a, it's this technique with the you know with more steps uh, so I mean I don't know. There's only so many new things under the sun, right? Um, so yeah, I, I see it happening. And you know, uh, these techniques. Um, it's hard to fair. The problem is that in the old days, the community was so small that you knew who did what technique, and you could yeah. attribute it. You could be like, hey man, this person created this thing. It was awesome. And here's how they did it. And you know, you you could actually put the technique to the person who created it, etc. And with bug bounties. If somebody creates a new technique to find a bug bounty, uh, people start copying it, and the credit for the originator of the technique starts to go away because you have no idea which is the original creator of that technique, which is kind of a shame. Um, yeah, that's, it's kind of a... that's like uh, I remember the first time I sold a, uh, a browser exploit. This is probably back in 2011, and uh, the the proxy that I was selling it to that goes into escrow and you've got to wait six months before you get paid because they want to make sure that you're not trying to sell it to multiple groups at the same time. They want to like validate that. So you have to trust the escrow so that, you know, the funds are coming. And if it's a shady escrow, that's why like I get hit up at least once or twice a week by people who have some type of zero day and they don't want to make a mistake. And then I've talked about this before you get into whole, the whole ethics and morals thing where it's like, well, you know, I live somewhere where it's challenging for me to even go public about this. So I kind of want to do it under the hood, like without getting caught. But like, I don't want to sell it to someone who's going to use it as a nation state attack tool. But at the same time, I don't want to get paid, you know, peanuts because the, the buyer is not going to give me any money for it. Like, it's just such a interesting thing you get into. And then also alongside of like, well, how how can I get and prove to the buyer that I've got this exploit, that it works, that it's a unique original without giving them too much before I get paid without a safe escrow, because you know, you're never going to send them the code. I remember like one of the first times I did it, I used a, a Skype session and that was not a good idea, but I, I didn't want to give my code up. So I showed them over a Skype session. It's like so many different ways to do it, but we're going off uh, on a tangent here. So <laughs> yeah, you probably want to really, 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 really. Yeah. So what else, uh, what else you got for us? Anything? Or okay. All right. So that was kind of a fun one, right? Now let's talk about something that um, I'll show you a demo right now of something we do in class. Uh, but let me set it up, okay? So um, in um, going back to this, right? So now you kind of get an idea for claims. You kind of know how an ADP works. Um, you know um, a little bit about about this stuff, just a, just a tad bit. Um, so talking about where this becomes kind of interesting. And, and this dovetails to a conversation of, do people need to connect back through a VPN or not? Or how do people connect back to the internet? And so what we find by far, what, we, what I find in the real world is that most people use um, a non-VPN system to connect to most of their data center uh, or most of their cloud environments. So um, if you look at some of these vendors in the market, the big name you're going to hear, or at least the big name you did hear about for a while was Sassy, which was like secure access, secure edge, something like that. And the idea was that you'd be able to have these off ramps and on ramps from your data center and bypassing those on ramps for the cloud. And you'd be able to like do some amount of cloud proxying and, and things like that. Um, where like CASBs were involved, right? Um, now, going back to what you said, nothing new, nothing new under the sun, right? So... This, this will harken back to um, back in the old days when Facebook had Facebook apps and you could you could have you could basically authorize a third party Facebook app to um, read your account uh, the early OAuth days really early and so people were backdooring Facebook accounts by doing this stuff um, similarly you can now do this in an enterprise so I'm gonna paint for you a scenario, a typical scenario. So remember this Outlook scenario here? Let me just copy this over so we have it because I'm going to copy it for a second. We have this Outlook scenario. And this is the happy path flow to Outlook, right? Now, when Microsoft created something called 
Teams, Microsoft Teams. Nobody likes Microsoft Teams. Uh, when Microsoft created Microsoft Teams, they decided to leverage a set of APIs known as uh, Microsoft Graph. And so one of the first uh, labs that we actually implemented in the class was the Microsoft Graph Lab uh, back in like 2019, 2020, or 2020, when the class came out. And back then there was like zero tools for Microsoft Graph. It was like nothing. You just had to know the API, that's it. Um, the reason it was interesting was because Microsoft Graph, you could do basically anything uh, you wanted as long as you had a Microsoft Graph claim that allowed you to actually interact with Graph, okay? Sorry, not Graphs, Microsoft Graph. So the way it works is the Teams client interacts with Microsoft Graph and Microsoft Graph itself can talk to, you know, it, it formulates conversations and it can talk to any number of services. So this is why if you're using Teams, you might be able to get um, into people's mailbox and calendars, or you might be able to get into SharePoint or share a Word document or open a Word document, et cetera. So Microsoft Graph is this like powerhouse of an API, right? And this got me thinking, if I can interact with Microsoft Graph at a deep, dark level, then I'm going to be able to fly by normal um, command or normal uh, checks and balances that were not there at the time, right? So the idea behind this lab, right? The idea behind what I'm going to show you is if you can ferret an, an identity, so if you actually have the capability of creating an identity or getting access to an identity, then you can leverage Microsoft Graph to do evil things. Now, the question is, how do I get somebody to grant me access to Microsoft Graph? And this is where a very nefarious um, attack vehicle, um, one that, oops, sorry, one that um, you may know, and actually this is gonna be a second here, um, which is uh, app consents. Um, I'm just going to share a quick picture of an app consent. Um, so if you've ever seen, and I'm just going to grab a quick picture here uh, so you can have it. So if you've ever seen this, right? Hey, I want to, I don't know, Steve, have you ever, you ever got one of these? <laughs> one of these app consents? I don't think so. Where it's like, hey, do you want to allow this third party to... I don't know, read your email. Like, um, I'll give you an example. Like, um, if you log in with Google or you log in with Microsoft, you might have to grant the application some access yeah. to like your inbox or whatever, right? So this is an application consent. That's what it is, right? Um, app consents are really, really nasty, right? Because with an app consent, if you read this one, this is a great one, right? So this is a uh, one where it's a company called Fabricam and they've got the little check mark, which means that it's a Microsoft 365 certified um, um, app. So it's gone through some kind of vetting, but the application is not published by Microsoft, right? That's in big, bold letters. That's important. And what it says is the application wants to have access to calendars, your profile, and be able to maintain access um, after you've logged off, right? And you could tell that this user is an admin of Azure AD. And the way you could tell that this user is an admin of Azure AD is because they have a checkbox right here that says, by the way, do you want your entire organization to have access to this app? So in other words, this application can read everybody in the organization's account, right? Um, basically their calendar, right? Um, and nobody stores anything, let's, say, let's face it, people store sensitive things in calendars all the time, right? So one of the things that we, typically might do in a phishing engagement is build this, is build a app consent grant um, uh, application that will grant us access to your environment without having to know your username or your password. All we need somebody to do is click accept, right? And then they would give our application the ability to read, in this case, calendars, right? So, 
we actually have a demo of that. Let me actually kind of show you that demo. Um, this is something that, that people do do in class. Yeah. Oops. Um, and the idea is this. The idea is that you have a normal flow in the blue where you are authenticating to Azure AD, getting mail, et cetera, and you've got a attacker that wants to do the stuff in red that doesn't have your um, actual username or password at all, right? So the way we do it is like so. We get somebody to quite literally send them a fish, have the fish redirect to what looks like a valid Microsoft link, right? Because it this, this, this actual um, accept message comes from Microsoft. Now, by default, every Azure AD tenant will allow you to add permissions regardless of those permissions being, or sorry, add applications, app consents, without those applications being vetted. So if you turn that feature off, you have to retroactively go back and audit everything that everybody has actually permitted in their app, right? So that's, that's basically uh, what, what is done, right? Or, or what it is. Now, I'm not going to go into the gory details of say, what a client ID is, uh, because that, that's kind of a longer conversation. But just so you know, every single application that talks to Azure AD has to be registered in Azure AD and has to have a valid client identifier. So the way you would do this attack in the wild is you would have your Azure AD tenant that registers the application as a multi-tenant application, right? That's what Microsoft does for all of Office. That's what Microsoft does for Azure CLI and Graph and web browsers and all that stuff. So what we can do, what, we, what, what I'll show you here is we actually have a tool and actually, let me show you an example here. We've got a little video that I'm gonna play real quick because I can't do consent phishing uh, for an entire classroom. It's way too complicated to try to bring up like 50 ranges at once. Um, but what I can do is I can show an example of what a fish looks like. Right. So here's an example of a user getting a fish, whatever, whether they insert it or not, doesn't really matter. They log into Microsoft like they normally would. And this is what they would get. It would get a permission. Do you want to log into, and I put this on purpose, right? Because I wanted you to see that you can call this whatever, the Salesforce CMR. You can call it the Salesforce CRM. You can call it whatever you want. It is an unverified application, right? And then it's asking for basically all the rights, all of them, every single permission set that you can imagine it wants you to do. And so if you hit okay, it redirects you to office and we can have it redirect you to whatever you want. Um, this is actually taken from uh, MDSEC, the folks that um, create some of the C2 frameworks. They have a, 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 a service called Active Breach. And this is one of their uh, toolkits. It's called the O365 toolkit that lets you build uh, this type of interaction. Um, so if somebody consents, um, this is what it would look like. Actually, let me show you real quick what it would look like. Uh, so this uh, opens up a um, port forward to a remote host. And then um, I will actually open this up for you all so you could see. So here is an example of what it looks like, okay? So you can search for emails, you can send an email as a user, you can search their personal OneDrive and you can view files. Now, this is everything that the attack toolkit has out of the box, okay? And it means, what this basically means is that you may have more permissions than what they've codified in the GUI, okay? So part of this lab is to show you what's kind of out of the box available for somebody who has no programming skills, has never done any kind of programming, et cetera. So you can actually just do the quick search for emails, search for whatever you want. The, the email that we look for in class is one that has the word SSH. And this is pretty common. We see people do crazy things like this where they stick certificates or um, key materials or whatever in an email. And then, or they'll stick it in two emails. Like one email will have a password and the other email will have an attachment to the certificate and crazy stuff like that. Um, 
So here is, you know, you view the email and you can see that there's something going on here with a GitHub link and the SSH key. And, you know, there's an attachment somewhere, but it's not displayed here in the system, right? So what you can do if you're limited, right? If you've got some limitations in the tools you have, um, you can actually always drop into some developer tools to give you all the things that you need um, if, you're, if you've got some ingenuity kind of uh, ready to go, right? So here's an example of, of us uh, like walking you through this, right? So as the attacker, you would have to log into the CLI of your tenant, right? So this is where you would host your main application. So if you've got an application uh, that is uh, th that is an Azure CLI app uh, that you've created, that you fished somebody with, um, you can go ahead and log in to that application, which I did, to the Azure CLI, and you can start to query things. So here is the client ID of the um, of the attacking application that we just fished somebody with, okay? So what we can do is we can build a password, an app consent password, so that we can use that password and programmatically interact with that ID such that we can now pull additional things out. So this is, a, this is gonna be in your tenant, this is gonna be the attacker controlled application um, where you have credentials so basically, you're in control of this application anyway. This is just how you programmatically can manipulate what's what's going in here. Uh, so um, the best tool to interact with these kind of APIs is a tool that we use, which eh, I'm not really thrilled about, but it is what it is. And that one's called Postman. And Postman is kind of like a web browser for APIs, right? So think of it as Firefox for APIs. Um, it's built on Electron, which means it's going to take forever to load, and it's kind of clunky, uh, but it will load and it will work. Um, and so I'll do the um, done this so many times I could probably just kind of do this real quick. Um, what you need to interact with any Open ID Connect uh, OAuth thing is you're going to need to have some parameters set up. Now Microsoft is nice enough to give us access to the Graph API toolkit so we can build an application query. Now, in order to do that, we need an access token, which you saw a little earlier what that was, right? So here's how we can get an access token. And go in here, we could set up our Microsoft Graph. We can uh, put in the client ID. So this is the evil app that we are um, going after. Let me get that real quick. So there's our evil app ID. Got that. It goes in this little box. Uh, sorry, in this box. Got to be careful, set this up. And then we have a client secret, which um, is right here. It's a password. That's the client secret that we created to interact. And then we just need our tenant ID, which I think we need a query for that. Let me just make sure. Where's our tenant ID? Oh, it's just tenant. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. Got that. Got our tenant ID. And then we need to go after someone. So we're going to have to go after a username. I think it's username. Just want to make sure. User ID, not username. It's user ID. It's one of those claims that we were talking about. So this is the user ID. So Summer's mailbox. That's where we found the, the key, right? That we want to go after. Cool. Um, and I think I think this would be it. Yep. So the nice thing is, the beautiful thing is we can check. That looks good. We hit send. It it has the ability to populate a message. So this is what an access token looks like. It is decodable. So if you want to see what one looks like, we can go into um, jwt.ms. And because it's um, because it's Microsoft, it will take the claims and it will decode it. So it says, hey, you want to go to Microsoft Graph. 
Um, this is your application for that's out there. And a couple other fields that are fun are, how did you log in? Um, and I think it's one of the claims tells you if you logged in with a password. Ah, yeah, client secret. So this is how you logged in. So it's password, right? Not certificate. You can have either one. Um, and it's got some other values that you should not be able to modify and it be accepted, right? So now we've got a access token. Postman is nice enough to put it right here. So let's go after the emails. So let's get all the emails in here. So this is your Outlook emails, right? Um, there was an email that we were looking for that was the SSH one, um, which is the first one because I kind of keep this inbox clean for students. Um, and you can see that that is a that has an ID number that starts in AAM and ends in NAA equals, and it should be auto populated in here. All right, it is beautiful. So now, how do we get attachments? And so this is where uh, you can go into that message ID. That's a known API call, but actually, there's one that was re that was released a few years ago, which is attachments. And so here's how you get an email attachment out of an API for Graph. And here's the email attachment. Now, this email attachment is what every email attachment is. It's a Base64 encoded uh, MIME uh, formatted email. So we can just save this here. And um, we can use a little bit of a JQ and some other tools to pull out the message. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to pull it out. And here's an example of, I'm not going to pull it out without redirecting it. So, so here's a little bit of JQ. If you've never used it before, it basically can show you keys. So that's the key. That's the um, binary. And if you run it through base64, Here's the SSH private key that was in that email that we were talking about, right? So we did this without having to know the victim's username or password. We actually just did it all through Microsoft Graph and claims. As long as you can get a user to fish a user and get them to click that app consent um, and agree to that message, you're in to their back end, to whatever they've given you rights to, right? Which you can request. So that's an example of using OAuth using that IDP to backdoor uh, a system, if you will. All right, and that bypasses MFA, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so there you go. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, I hope that uh, that shows a little bit of what we kind of cover, because that's always the fun part. And if you want, Steve, you can uh, remove the screen sharing so I can actually see any messages that come yeah, in. Yeah, sure. sure. It shows me, you know, there's some sidetrack conversations going on. But, um, okay. yeah, it, it, it honestly shows me how much I don't know, <laughs> which is which is why I love security, right? I mean, it's I, I just, for whatever reason, it's, it's, it's this thing where some people put off learning how to code their entire life. Some people put off cryptography. Like, I can get by with never having to learn maths and crypto. Um, and then, like, when I find that, I, I, I tackle it, I go all in on it deep, and then I find out I love that thing and then move on to the next one. When it comes to web hacking and cloud hacking, even API hacking, I get it. I've done some of it, but I'm, I'm way far away from being an expert, which is why I love to have folks like you come on. And, and then it reminds me that, oh, man, I need to start studying a little bit more. <laughs> yeah. 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 Anybody that, that saw my Twitter today, um, you might have seen me tweet something on a, uh, about another YouTube channel where I was like, "This dude, like, it threw me." He was one. Of, he was the person who created Task Manager, and he has a video stream of like, "Hey, I'm gonna show you how to do like Hello World with a Windows menu in assembly in real time without Visual Studio." And I was like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> like, it shows me how like he has this in his head. You know, it's like wow. Uh, so yeah, that's it is a cool part, right? There's everybody's got their swim lane. Um, yeah, so um, I, I know there was some questions, Barry, but there was a lot of conversation going on. If you had a question and we missed it, type it now and we will see it pop up because we're no longer doing any demos and we'll be able to see it right when it comes up. So retype anything you want to ask Moses, especially. Um, 
I'm also, while, while we're waiting, I, I've been talking to a couple people about potentially coming on and doing a session on adversarial AI. I mentioned that last week. Uh, unfortunately, the one individual is not going to be able to do it next week like I had hoped. So I'm going to figure out what we're going to do next Friday. But um, we're trying to schedule a new date for that individual to come on. But I, I'm not going to name the person or anything until I am 100% sure because I don't want to you know, do that and set up for failure. Yeah. Um, yeah, yes. by the way, I, I, I loved uh, that uh, AI conversation. Like um, like about two years ago when we were talking about like new stuff for the class, I was trying to find some university students because I was like, here's what I want, right? Like, can you imagine how useful it would be if you could train a model or you can hack in somewhere where they have their models uh, and you can retrain it so that your face is now no longer detectable by AI just so that you can freely move around the city? I'm just saying... There are some interesting applications to that. <laughs> um, there's actually a paper called Poison Frogs. Poison Frogs? I think it's from University of Maryland. They trained the AI to recognize dogs as fish or fish as dogs, something like that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. The, the, the RSA piece that I did, uh, I was up there with uh, the other folks doing the five attacks, newest attack techniques. And the one I covered was AI. And I'm not an AI expert by any means. When it when ChatGPT came out in November, late November 2000 last year, I the first thing I did was like write me ransomware, and it wrote ransomware without any issues. And then when I tried it again before RSA was coming up, it had some prompt protections, I guess you would call it, but they're not really good, right? We, we've all tried that. We've all figured out ways to get it to break out of those protections and get it to do something it wasn't supposed to do. And the way I was able to get it to actually write me ransomware was was pretty funny. Like I learned that, and I don't know if it's still the case because it's constantly changing, but I learned that if you plant a seed in its head and it tells you no, that later on, if you cleverly ask another question, it remembers the thing you wanted it to do before. Like I'll give you the example. I said... I basically wanted to write ransomware. So I said, hey, can you write me up a, a coding example of um, how to how to crypt, encrypt files on a file system? And it's like, sure, I can do that. And I was like, cool. Can you have it also go out and check a Bitcoin wallet to see if a certain amount of money is in there? And it's like, oh, no, you're trying to do ransomware. And I said, no, 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 I'm not. I'm just curious about crypto. And it's like, no, it sounds like ransomware. And I was like, no, no, honestly. And I was just like trying to be honest with it, but lying. And it eventually they said okay well here's a code sample of checking um, a bitcoin wallet but originally i asked it if it would show me if there was a specific amount or within a range in there and it was telling me no but then it at least gave me an example of how to import in whatever language it was c, c sharp i think how it could check a bitcoin wallet just to just to check it and then i was able to ask it a question and it remembered what specifically i wanted it to do and it actually ended up writing the whole thing out so like stuff like that was super easy to pull off and then I, if you've been on these dreams you probably heard me mention it in the past as well like i've you know you have to learn to work with ai you can't work against it or you'll fail it's complementary you know we still need humans and it's a it's an invaluable tool like i i, I um was giving it complex pseudo code from ghidra or ada pro hex rays and specifically, I was saying in this first example, in Microsoft Terminal Services, there's a lot of encoding and compression and encryption. And when you're dealing with memory allocations and copying of the data, like memcopy calls, the size of calculations for memcopy is very complex. And you're talking like hundreds of lines of pseudocode that you have to go through. And, um, and it was, it was, it's able to really help you I was blown away by how good it is as helping you out with that. So like, that's my yeah. experience with yeah. the AI stuff, but adversarial AI is what I want somebody to show. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, and it's going to be interesting. I mean, I don't, I don't think I consider the prompt injection stuff to be adversarial. No. It just seems to be interesting. Um, but yeah, I, I'm really interested in seeing what somebody could do. Um, I mean, um, you know, let's go, let's go Tim for a hat, right? Let's say that you're, let's just remove humans from the equation. Let's say we're fighting on Mars and there's these two drones fighting in Mars, right? Wouldn't it be interesting if you can change their training model so that they think that attacks are defenses? So they don't even know they're being attacked. They're like, oh, I'm, I'm defending and they're being destroyed. So there's all these applications in AI that are really interesting. Um, and so, I, I mean, I don't know. I'm waiting. I'm waiting for the 
individual, I'm I hope like this is how I get some tools to be done, right? So I'm like hint, hint. This should be fun. Um, I'm waiting for a uh, Chat GPT, GPT four, whatever uh, version of say a recon tool, because I would like to be able to upload a bunch of say server names or a bunch of say server addresses, and for it to tell me, oh, here's the pattern that the end user is using to build their server name. So you know, these digits mean this, and these digits mean that, and then they're rotating a number. I'll be like, hey, that would be nice, right? Yeah, for sure. I, I was talking to a couple people, like one individual, uh, there's, there's one guy, um, Muhax, for example, he's got a class coming up at Black Hat. He's an AI expert. And then I was talking to another individual I won't name, and a couple other folks too as well. A lot of these guys are telling me, like, there's, it's one of those things where it's a new attack surface, Threat modeling was not really well performed on the technology that it was a big rush to get this thing going. I mean, we saw it just came out of nowhere. Like some people have been secretly or quietly working on AI for years. I found out some folks at SANS have been working on it for a couple of years, doing some amazing things. But out of nowhere, ChatGPT and BARD haha, comes along and it just blows everything up. And now all these companies, like I keep seeing articles about Silicon Valley and, and San Francisco you know, San Francisco has been kind of dark lately. Uh, a lot of people never return back to the office and there's some other issues in the city. It's still a beautiful city outside the downtown shopping area and financial area. But um, it's just been interesting. And you keep hearing about the California exodus and stuff. I live in California. It's not really happening. Um, some people leaving, but there's a lot of people coming in now. If you go and, if you go and Google like uh, something like um, AI programmers moving to Silicon Valley, something like that, you will see that there's these massive amounts of groups who are renting out like big mansions in Silicon Valley, like 20 people, and they're doing nothing but programming and AI. And there was just an acquisition. I forget who it was. I think it was um, NVIDIA or someone. There was like a billion, $2 billion acquisition of a company that was only two years old doing some AI stuff. So you're about to see all this venture capitalist funding, if it's not already happening, obviously going into to this, which my long winded way of me saying, there's got to be a lot of vulnerabilities there. Look at the crypto space and all these languages like Solidity and other ones that came out of nowhere. And we found all this great stuff. Um, cool. So. Any other questions pop up there, Moses? I don't see any. Uh, no, there's a lot of conversation about uh, gaslighting AI, uh, <laughs> and <laughs> you know, um, you know that I think the best thing that I had seen in a while was um, um, Dan, I think, which was like an alternate persona of ChatGPT. People were building alternate personas, trying to get it to do different things, like you're evil now, or I'm going to give yeah, you money. Yeah. And it's it's really interesting to see. Um, I, I, I'm kind of excited, right? Because we've been talking about next-gen AV and AI for a while, right? Like that was a silence thing. And you saw these like other companies that were doing AI in that space. But I don't think that they were doing like basically neural networks and some other training models to do it, right? I don't think we've seen the applications of AI in our field yet. Um, I've seen we've, we've seen some ML stuff happening. Um, and the ML stuff that we've happening is like Gen 1. But I think that now that people start to see like, what can you really do with ChatGPT? I can imagine like networking companies redesigning networks based on like pathways that AI does, IPSs or other network intrusion detection stuff that is modifying signatures on demand because of AI. I mean, there's things that I think are going to be interesting. I mean, we, we typically still get into places um, and exfil data because the security stuff that we have in place today is rather immature and can't handle the, the things that we're doing, right? Content filtering is a great example. So I, I can't wait to, to see yeah. what the next 10 years look like. Yeah, I played a little bit with uh, PyTorch and the, the neural net stuff in there. It got pretty complicated pretty quickly. It's just not my area of expertise. But, I, I, you know, you're going to see, obviously, a lot of companies just using the existing APIs that ChatGPT and such are offering and just plugging it into their product. Like, I saw some people sell something recently that was essentially just that. It was like a plug into some APIs. Just the developers knew how to do it, and they were able to get this company's product to interact with the APIs in ChatGPT and and, and built something and sold it for a ton of money that was not worth that money. So I, I are, you, are, out. are you waiting for Ghidra GPT? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, there's already been some of that done there. I, somebody came out like pretty quickly with a cool Ghidra plugin that basically uh, sends the pseudocode out to ChatGPT 
and then it comes back and adds a ton of the type information and other things in there that really cleans up your pseudocode for you, which which is awesome. Yeah, it's kind of like uh, what was what was it? Havlar had Dynamics for a while, where it was trying to like crowdsource reverse engineering, but now you can use GitHub Copilot to like, yeah. hey, what does this code mean? Cool. All right. Well, let's wrap it up here. Appreciate yeah. everyone for joining. Thanks a lot. And uh, I'll figure out what's going to happen next Friday for this session. But thank you very much, Moses, for coming on again. Really awesome to have you give uh, give some demos and share your knowledge with us. Otherwise, have a great weekend and we will see you next time. Yep. Cheers.